Today we're going to solve a nice functional equation from the 2015 India team selection test for the Mathematical Olympiad. So let's see what we have here. Our goal is to find all functions from non-negative integers to non-negative integers. So in other words, from the natural numbers including 0 to the natural numbers including 0, such that f of m squared plus m f of n is equal to m f of m plus n. And this is true for all non-negative integers m and n. Okay, nice. So looking at this, I think the fact that we've got a multiplier of m to the entire right-hand side gives us some motivation to set m equals zero, equal to 0 because that'll zero out this right-hand side. So that's actually the first thing that we'll do. So we're going to set m equal to 0 and then n will be free. So in other words, n will be free to be any other non-negative integer. Okay, so let's see what that gives us. So we'll have f of 0 squared plus 0 times f of n, but that's just f of 0, equals 0 times f of n, but again, that's just 0. So we see that f of 0 must be equal to 0. Okay, so that's good. Now that we know that f achieves the value of 0 somewhere at 0, this really motivates the question, does it ever achieve the value of 0 at a point which is non-zero? And we're going to break this into two cases. So our case 1 is there is a z which is not equal to zero. So in other words, it's a natural number. I can just cut off the zero part over here such that f of z equals zero. So that'll be case one. And case two will be that f of z is not equal to zero unless z is equal to zero. Okay, but anyway, let's cover this case one first. Okay. So now let's set m equal to m. So in other words, it's free, but it's non-zero. And then we'll set n equal to z to plug into our functional equation. So looking over here, that makes sense to do because notice we'll have a zero here because this will collapse to f of z. But anyway, let's write that down. So that's gonna give us f of m squared plus m f of z equals m times f of m plus z. But now we can simplify this using the fact that f of z equals 0 by our assumption. And that gives us that f of m squared equals m times f of m plus z. Okay, so that's starting to look good. It looks like we're kind of getting close to something that looks like periodicity, but we're not quite there. And now we'll play a similar game. We'll set m equal to something free, but non-zero. And then we'll set n equal to zero. And this is motivated by the fact that we know f of zero is zero already. So let's see what that gives us. That'll give us f of m squared on the left-hand side. That's because f of zero is zero. Equals m times f of m plus zero, but then that's just f of m. Okay, nice. But now notice we've created an equation, f of m squared equals f of m squared, meaning f of m times m is the same thing as m times f of m plus z. So for all m from the non-negative integers, we have f of m plus z equals f of m. Okay, so let's talk our way through that. There's something subtle going on. If m is non-zero, then we can take this equality and just cancel the m from both sides. But if m is equal to zero, this follows by our definition of z and the fact that f of zero is zero. Okay, so anyway, we've got that this is periodic with a period of z. But that'll tell us that f only takes on a finite number of values. So let's maybe note that we have the image of f is the same thing as 
f evaluated at 0, f evaluated at 1, all the way up to f evaluated at z minus 1, f evaluated at z, f evaluated at z plus 1, and so on and so forth. So I've just listed f evaluated at every natural number. But we've got some equalities here. We know that f of z is the same thing as f of 0 by our setup. We know f of 1 is the same thing as f of z plus 1 by this equation, and then so on and so forth. So that means everything out here is just a repeat of everything in this list of z numbers here. So we've got this is equal to f of 0, f of 1, all the way up to f of z minus 1. So in other words, our function f only takes on a finite number of values. So let's bring that fact to the top and we'll keep going. So far we've determined that f of 0 is always 0 and we're looking at the case when f achieves the value of 0 somewhere that is non-zero. We've called that place z. Then we determined that the image of f was this finite set of points, f of 0, f of 1, up to f of z minus 1. Furthermore, we've got this one other tool which will be useful for what we're about to do. That's f of m squared is m times f of m. So the fact that f only takes on finitely many points means it has a maximum. So let's take our number y. So let's say y is between 0 and z minus 1 such that f of x is less than or equal to f of y for all x in our domain. Okay, so again, we know that the image is this finite set of points. We can just take the maximum value from this finite set of points. That maximum will be f of y. So let's sketch that out. So we extract the maximum from this set. That maximum will be f of y. And the y will definitely come from 0 to z minus 1. Okay, now we're going to do a little calculation based on the fact that we have periodicity along with this equation right here. Maybe let's add the periodicity in here. So f of m plus z equals f of m. So that's one of the other things that we'll use here. Okay, so let's start with our maximum value for our function. So that's f of y. So that must be bigger than or equal to f evaluated at anything. So we're going to carefully choose our anything to evaluate f at, being motivated by the periodicity as well as this equation right here, and that will be y plus z squared. So now we can apply this equation right here. That will give us y plus z times f of y plus z. Then we can apply the periodicity to get y plus z times f of y. Okay, so that's looking good. But now we can move everything around. Maybe we'll subtract this f of y from both sides. And that will give us y plus z minus 1 times f of y is less than or equal to 0. So again, that's just from taking this inequality and subtracting this f of y over. But let's notice that this number right here is most definitely bigger than or equal to zero. And then f of y is also bigger than or equal to zero. So if we've got the product of two things being bigger than or equal to zero, but if we've got the product of two non-negative things being less than or equal to zero, that means they must be equal to zero. So in other words, we have y plus z minus one times f of y equals zero. But that's going to split into two cases. So the first case will be that y plus z minus 1 equals 0. In other words, y plus z equals 1. But that means that y is equal to 1 or z is equal to 1, given that y and z come from the set of non-negative integers. So let's point that out. y and z come from the set of non-negative integers. So one of them must be equal to 0 and one of them must be equal to 1. Well, from up here, we know that z is not equal to 0. So that tells us that y must be equal to 0 and z must be equal to 1. 
But if y is equal to zero, the maximum of our function is f of zero, which is equal to zero. But if the maximum of our function is zero, then our function is identically zero. So this tells us f of x is identically equal to zero. Now we can similarly see that if we were to argue from this period being one, that we also get something which is identically zero, but we only need to worry about one of them. Okay, so let's go in the other direction. So the other direction would say that f of y equals zero. But again, that takes us to the same point. f of y is the maximum. If the maximum is zero, then that tells us that the function is identically zero. So regardless of which direction we go, we get our function is identically zero. And the function which is identically zero most definitely satisfies this equation. Okay, so now let's move on to our second case. So far, we've shown that f of zero is always zero, and if f achieves the value of zero at somewhere that is non-zero, then f is identically the zero function. Now ready move on to, to move on to our second case, which is what happens if f of x is not equal to zero for all x not equal to zero. In other words, the only time our function is equal to zero is at zero. And we're going to start with this assumption and show initially that f is injective, and that'll pretty much take us all the way home. Okay, so how can we show that this is injective? Well, we'll do the standard proof outline for showing something is injective. So let's suppose that a is less than or equal to b such that f of a is equal to f of b. And what we want to end up with is that, in fact, A is equal to B. So here I've allowed for equality or inequality. But if we show this equation right here implies that we have equality, then we have injectivity. That's by the definition of injectivity. Okay, so nice. So now what we're going to do is use our functional equation. So let's let m be free as we did before, and we'll let n be equal to a and see what that gives us. So plugging that into our functional equation, we have f of m squared plus m times f of a is equal to m times f of m plus a. Okay, so that's good. And now we'll do something similar. So let's set m equal to a free variable again, and then we'll set n equal to b. So that's motivated off of the fact that f of a is equal to f of b. So let's see, that's gonna give us f of m squared plus m times f of b equals m times f of m plus b, like that. But let's notice that this guy right here, this f of a is equal to this f of a, which means the entire argument of this function on the top is equal to the entire argument of the function on the bottom, which in turn tells us that this is equal to this and thus this is equal to this. So as long as m is not equal to zero, maybe we should also assume that m is not equal to zero. Let's put that in here. We can cancel the m's and we'll, we, and we'll see that f of m plus a is equal to f of m plus b. So now let's set m equal to x minus a. And this is possible as long as x is bigger than or equal to a. What I'm going for here is pushing this addition of an element just to one of these functions. Okay, so let's see what that gives us. So we'll be left with f of x on this left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, we'll be left with f of x plus b minus a. So what does that tell us? That tells us that we have a period of b minus a for all x bigger than a. So in other words, our function becomes periodic after a point. But if it's periodic after a point, we know that its image will have a finite number of values, just as we saw before. So that tells us that our image of f is equal to zero, which is f of zero, f of one, f of two, ending at f of b. And after f of b, it'll start repeating again. 
but now we'll play the same game as we did before. So let's extract the maximum from this set and we'll call that maximum f of y again. So here y comes from the set one up to b. We know that y is not equal to zero because then f would identically be zero, but that would contradict our assumption up here. Okay, so let's bring that information up and we'll keep going. So far, we found a special number y between 1 and b, where f of x is less than or equal to f of y for all x bigger than or equal to 0. Now we're ready to play a similar game to what we did before. And that is, we'll take this f of y, that's the upper bound, that's going to be bigger than or equal to f evaluated at y plus b minus a quantity squared. Again, that's because this is the maximum value of our function. Okay, nice. But now we'll use something that we used before. Let's maybe put it up as a reminder. f of m squared equals m times f of m. And so that's the situation we have right here where m is equal to y plus b minus a. Good. So that means we have here, this is equal to y plus b minus a times f of y plus b minus a. But now we can apply the periodicity here, and that will give us y plus b minus a times f of y. But now, moving this f of y over, we'll see that, let's see, y plus b minus a minus 1 times f of y is less than or equal to 0. But then, just as we did before, we can change this inequality to an equality because this thing is most definitely non-negative and this thing is most definitely non-negative. In fact, this thing is most definitely positive given our assumption up here. So that means this guy right here is zero. We have y plus b minus a is equal to one. But now again, because of this up here, we know y is not equal to zero, which means y is in fact equal to one, which means b minus a is zero. But if b minus a is zero, we have b equals a, and we've achieved our proof that this is injective. Okay, so now we're ready to finish it off. So we just got done proving our function is injective. Now we have all of the tools to quickly finish it off. So we'll use our functional equation where m is equal to one and n is equal to n. So in other words, n is free. So let's see, that inside of our functional equation will give us f of one plus one times f of n, so that's gonna be f of n equals one times f of n plus one. But now we've got f evaluated at something is equal to f evaluated at something. Injectivity says that the interior of these functions must be equal. So we have f of n plus 1 equals f of n plus 1, if we just reorder it a little bit. But now putting in some values, we can see a pattern very quickly, and you might prove that pattern with induction. So let's notice that f of 1 will be equal to f of 0 plus 1, so that's 1. f of 2 will be equal to f of 1 plus 1, so that's 1 plus 1, which is 2. f of 3 will be equal to f of 2 plus 1, so that's 2 plus 1 is 3. And I think you can see that inductively, you'll very quickly end at f of n equals n. So that means we have two solutions to this functional equation. The trivial solution when f is identically zero, and then this solution here where f of n is equal to n. And that's a good place to stop.